Today I'd like to direct your attention to a PSP model that you probably don't know about or at the very least might have forgotten about and that's the PSP E1000 or the PSP Street models and I say probably because due to the circumstance of how these came out the timing and also the target demographic you may have easily forgotten about these or overlooked them throughout the years and we've got two here so let's talk about what is a very unusual but unique PSP model. Let's take a look at the black one first. Here it is, the PSP E1003, or as Sony called it, the PSP Street. And uh, part of the reason why you probably would not know about this, or there's a good chance, depending on where you live, you might not know about this, is that Sony did not release this model in North America. So only in Europe and PAL territories, which was kind of a big deal because this PSP had a completely different uh, chassis design, which was not typical. Normally if Sony released a brand new redesigned box, it was usually a global thing. And uh, what makes this even more a bit unusual and why even if you live somewhere where this was available, you still might've forgotten because this came out or rather it was initially announced during Sony's 2011 Gamescom press conference. And for those that remember, based on the timing, that's when, you know, PlayStation Vita was already announced. The 2011 Gamescom conference was largely about PS Vita, a little bit of PlayStation 3 stuff in there, but it was really, you know, all hands on deck for Vita. So we're talking game announcements for, I believe at the time it was Tearaway, uh, Killzone Mercenary, also just, just showcasing some UI features of PS Vita. I mean, everything getting ready for the eventual launch of PS Vita. So this had a very brief maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe like a minute or two minutes of what is announcing a brand new PSP priced at a very low affordable 99 euro right next to the PSP Essentials program, which was a collection of best-selling fantastic PSP games for 9.99 each. So this was certainly a end of life cycle PSP uh, cost down measure. And that's why the PSP 1000 is in kind of a weird spot of not many folks, uh, at least in terms of a, a core audience, would have cared too much about this. It's end life cycle. Everybody's looking at PS Vita. So this was likely appealing more towards um, your casual consumer or somebody that was uh, a parent. Maybe you want to get your kids something. And so this was a great way to get in. But we've got an example black unit here. It's not totally complete in box. In fact, this box is a little bit beat up and I try to find really good ones if I can, which kind of tells you a lot of these did in fact go to uh, children. And th there's not really many like on eBay or just in, in population in general. I suspect Sony maybe didn't sell nearly as many, many of these. By the time it was announced, they sold around 70 million something units. PSP topped off at about 88. So, uh, and also they still had PSP uh, Slim and Light, the PSP 3000 model. Uh, PSP Go, I think they were still selling a bit of, but it might have been discontinued right towards that very end portion of when this was announced. So, there might not have been a very good split or ratio for PSP uh, Street, but you can see it is a total redesign. Principally, it looks similar from a distance you maybe would not recognize that this was a different PSP but indeed it is because it's got a completely matte black finish which is certainly not typical every PSP model in this form factor has always had a glossy reflective finish even with different uh, color schemes and special editions this is the only one where it's got largely a completely matte black finish the only reflective parts are your face buttons your L and R, which are color matched this time around. And also you've got a slight reflective finish for your row of buttons down here, your start select, your um, plus uh, your, your volume control, your uh, PlayStation button right there. And this is the only part where it's gonna have some fingerprints show up. And you can also, uh, these are tactile buttons, by the way, it's not touch capacitive or anything like that. So this is definitely uh, still real buttons, but you can see how something like this, where it's actually a bit thicker too, compared to, a PSP 3000 so you can see that this thing isn't really meant to be the most stylish looking it's not meant to uh, be the most ultra portable it just has to be a bit thicker it has to be able to endure some slams on the ground and things like that and uh, one of the ways that Sony was able to cost this thing down is that there is no Wi-Fi in this model no internet connectivity whatsoever so you're not gonna find your WLAN switch on here if you look to the right it's completely bare, there's nothing there. Up top, of course, we have our UMD tray. The big change is that the whole back kind of flips out like that, and uh, you've got an integrated battery, so not meant to be user replaceable or anything like that, but your UMDs, of course, would go right there. 
You also have uh, an open door here for, well, not even a door, it's just open for your Memory Stick Pro Duo. You don't have your um, microphone, your power switch is down here. You still have hold to you know completely lock out your button presses, but otherwise we can boot this PSP up. And this was just a cheap way to get into PSP. Let's look at this white one now, and this box is uh, in better shape if it weren't for, well, all around it's uh, relatively clean outside of this little stain right here, but this box is looking pretty good. Not too bad. And it is a white model of the PSP Street, which came, I think, one year after the black one. This one is certainly a bit more complete inside with some documentation, original charger, which I can't make use of but it also has the same little packaging for where the system would have been tucked away if you had bought this brand new. And for a white model, and certainly a white machine that is meant to, uh, again, target demographic, likely went to a lot of children, this one's a very clean example unit. And it's the same deal. You've actually got color matching L and R buttons. UMD tray again. And it looks pretty good, right? Uh, the other unique thing is that mono uh, mono audio only, no stereo. So again, a lot of cost cutting measures. But that's another thing that Sony did to get this price down. And you might have noticed this on the black model, but if you were to, again, look at that row of uh, buttons down here, that there is, if it would focus, there's no um, brightness toggle on the very bottom which PSPs should normally have. That's actually going to be in your power save settings and your screen brightness is right there. So at a software level, this is the only way you can adjust this. And of course, uh, when we're on the XMB, you can see that we have no option for PlayStation Network. It's also got a slightly modified XMB where it does not need to have anything uh, internet related. No PlayStation Network, nothing like that. So of course, rather unsurprisingly, another cost-cutting measure of the PSP Street was no video out. So you were definitely not playing this on the big screen TV. That's why we have the camera pointed directly at the PSP Street's display to show off some gameplay. And that's why there's so many compromises to get this thing down to the price tag that it was at, which again was 99 euro. And that was extremely affordable at the time. Uh, for comparison's sake, the PSP 3000 was around 150 to 160 euro if I remember correctly, but certainly that was a very affordable way to get into PSP towards the end of its life cycle. You want this to get ugly? On the flip side though, there were certainly some merits to playing on a PSP Street. Not many, but the one that really sticks out to me is the display because it is essentially the same display across all three PSP models, which we're talking the 1000, 2000, 3000. Again, the PSP Go is our outlier here, but if we're comparing it to the similar form factors of the 1, 2, and 3000, the PSP Street, in my opinion, tends to be the most brightest, uh, although the 3000 has, uh, or it produces deeper colors, but the PSP Street definitely has the brightest display, not by a drastic difference. Uh, the biggest one there would be compared to the Street and the 1000, but by and large, I think the display on the Street model is actually quite nice, but that doesn't necessarily save this device because no online means you also have no ad hoc multiplayer. So even though this is considered a budget PSP where you expect, okay, I'm not going to get the luxuries of a 3000 or a PSP Go, you know, I'm not going to be able to connect to the PlayStation Store, I can't download games, I can't use the web browser, you expect that, but you also don't realize that you lose ad hoc multiplayer, so even if somebody's right next to you and you want to play some games, you just can't do that. If you're playing a game on the PSP Street and you attempt to go online or access any sort of multiplayer menu, the game often has a prompt telling you to turn on your WLAN switch, which you do not have. Now the form factor and materials are certainly interesting in that the PSP Street feels more like a 1000 versus the 2 or 3000 and that should not be shocking because the PSP Street is about as thick as a PSP 1000 model but it's also something where the back of the street is a matte finish much like the PSP 1000 and that's the only other PSP that has a matte finish on the back. All other PSP models including the PSP Go have uh, or they utilize glossy plastic and depending on the color, it also shows a lot of fingerprints, it also shows scratches. Black tends to be the worst there, 
but uh, you know, usually if you have a silver uh, PSP or a green one, that glossy plastic doesn't show fingerprints or scratches nearly as much, but certainly for the street, the back feels similar to a 1000, and that goes across the entire PSP street model where the front is a matte finish as well, which normally that is a huge benefit for some folks, but this isn't necessarily a nice matte finish. It's not even close to what you'd find on PlayStation home consoles, where a lot of those are a, a matte plastic. It's not the same here. It's just a lower grade, and that's why it tends to feel very cheap, which is exactly what the PSP Street is. And that's also why I'm not necessarily advocating for it. I'm not saying that this is a great PSP, it's a fantastic option, and you should run out and buy it, this, that, and the other. I mean, if you're a collector, or if you really enjoy the novelty of it, then sure, but otherwise it's not really a great PSP, because there are more compromises than there are positives. And nowadays, you might not even be able to get this for what was the MSRP. If you want one complete in box, it might actually cost you more than what this thing uh, cost back then. And really, it's a big issue not having easy access to the battery. So for PSPs, where that's really a big problem nowadays when it comes to degradation and battery bloat, you want to be able to easily access it, swap it out, and so that's going to be an issue for this model in general. But it could still make for a great PSP to mod, or just have around for pure single player enjoyment. Maybe you want to travel with it and you don't care if you lose it or drop it or damage it. There's options for this thing, but all around, there's certainly more cons than pros. So that about wraps it up for the PSP Street. Uh, definitely a very cool, unique piece of PlayStation hardware, especially because, uh, again, it's it's easily overlooked. Uh, so many folks either never had the chance to buy this and, and play it, or they knew about it, but again, at that time, it was all about PlayStation Vita. In fact, it's a very cool time capsule to go back and watch 2011 to 2012 Sony wear right before PS4 was announced, right? So PS3, and PSP are both at the end of their life cycle, but Sony was really like, they went all out on PS Vita. And nowadays the association with, or the reputation Sony has with PS Vita is that because Vita unfortunately failed, is that it was largely Sony's fault. They didn't support it, they didn't do this and that. But if you do go back to the launch of this handheld and also um, the pre-release hype and a little bit after, uh, they actually spent a ridiculous amount of time promoting and talking about and supporting PS Vita. Those first two years, they certainly like put in more effort than I think people seem to realize. And uh, even us talking about this this long is <laughs> is why the PSP Street tends to be completely forgotten. So I hope you enjoyed this close look at what is a very cool uh, piece of PlayStation history. But uh, thank you so much for watching. If you haven't just yet, please consider subscribing for the best PlayStation news, reviews, and updates that are here on YouTube. You can also find me on Twitter at Mystic Ryan, and that is it. I will see you all in my next video. You take it easy.